committee, we're looking at minimum wage, and Deb Brighton is going to come and talk to us about her work on the benefits club. And so, thank you. For, for the record, I'm Deb Brighton, and, and I'm a consultant to the Jack Fiscal Office. And so what I'm going to try to do is just talk about how the benefit cliff issue intersects with the minimum wage and why it's addressed in, in S40. Okay. Is that right? I think so. So we don't have the bill. We may never get it. Oh. Um, which is okay. fine. But uh, the fiscal note does talk about revenue impacts and um, it's a, a significant enough subject that I just felt that it made sense to get this committee as informed as possible. Um, the bill is still up in general committee, and we're going to hear from Tom Cabet after yeah. we hear from you. So, um, so I understand that we haven't taken a lot of testimony out of a little bit, but okay. we had choice in Manchester. And Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so benefit cliff is a term that's been around for a really long time, and we're not exactly using it to mean a cliff. Um, but if we look at in this chart, this is sort of the landscape that we would like to see. <laughs> and we've looked at this landscape for all the different types of families that are in the basic needs budget. And so across the bottom here, you have gross earnings increasing from zero to 82,500. And then up the bar, up this axis, is showing you the net resources that they have available to be able to meet their basic needs. And the, I'm sorry, the solid bar at the bottom is uh, their earnings, their net earnings. And then the other little bars on top are the different types of public benefits, the value of the different types of public benefits that can help. So net earnings is after tax earnings. That's yes. Earnings? The okay. tax is actually showing down us on the, the bottom. whole thing down okay. at the bottom. But this is after tax, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, and so what you see, this is just a single person, simplest case, but what you see is there's no cliff. Essentially, as earnings increase, the income doesn't go up necessarily straight up, but it continues going up. So that you're not seeing that when somebody earns an extra dollar, they lose $2 in net resources, which would be the cliff. Okay, and so we ran through these for every different type of household. And then the next chart, um, is that it? No, no. that's not the next. Yep. The next, the next one should be two people. people. That, that's it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so this one is the only family type where we ran into problems. And that is the cliff, as we're going to call it, is there's this decline in net resources as your income in increases in this range. So, uh, um, I, don't want to, I, I don't know if you were mid-sentence, so I had a question. Did you get to finish your sentence? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the, um, I see you have the federal EITC on here, and I'm looking for the state EITC, and I don't see it, but is it reflected in the after-tax income, or where is the, so um, I really. The state EITC is there, it uh, is. I think it's the purple at the top. Vermont yeah. ATC. Yeah. It's oh, arranged in a kind of a strange yeah. order. Right. Senator Pearson asked for the um, the ones that were le least likely to influence to be on the bottom, and the ones that were more, most likely to be able to change on the top. Yeah. So the state ones are at the top. So there is a bill that the House has approved that would increase the Vermont EITC. What does that do to this chart? Does it move the the, the, this thing out of it? Um, a tiny amount, mostly increases. So now we're at 32% and we would increase to 35%. Just um, about 3%. So, I mean 10%. That moves it up a little bit, um, this purple one. And so then when it comes down, it it's a little bit higher when it's coming down as well, on the down slope. I'll, I'll show a picture of the EITC in a minute. Um, okay. To explain more of that, okay. Um, the other it, thing I have a question about this is sort of a more general question. Um, but maybe I, maybe I should stay focused on that detail first. But um, the um, federal tax code has obviously changed pretty dramatically. But the state tax code is um, 
I think, going to change. Um, it'll change, even if we do nothing, it changes in some weird ways. Um, it, is there a way to reflect those changes in this chart, or are we um, just in a position of having to analyze this based on a tax code, on two tax codes that are no longer in effect? Um, I think that the tax code, the federal tax code, doesn't really affect this much at all, except in that it um, reduces the revenues that come in, so the subsequent budgets and other legislation to meet the revenue needs cut the different benefits. But, but they it's, didn't. It's unknown at this I mean, point. They, they could, but they didn't. They haven't yet. They haven't. I mean, the current budget didn't. The right. one that was just signed. We, federal budget. We don't know the, the actual outcome of, of all the different pieces. Um, you know, for example, I think right now the farm bill has cuts to food stamps in it. Yeah. Eliminates fuel assistance, I think. So. Um, so it may be some impacts that we. <coughs> that's correct. Um, and what about the changes that the state has? Uh, the changes that the state's proposing are, are with the exception of the EITC. Um, are not really affecting this term. Even though they do affect after-tax income in both cases? Yeah, there's very little after-tax income, well, it, in this income range. I hope I'm not blaming. I just would appreciate a quick rundown as to what all these programs are. Yeah. I think I know okay. most of them, but yeah. there are a few I'm not familiar yeah. with. They're okay. off okay. the top of my head. Okay. So starting from the bottom, the big guys, and the ones that cause this problem because they decline, three squares is this blue one. Mm -hmm. That's food stamps, right? Yes. And let's see. So we have about 80,000 people getting three squares now, and it's bringing in $114 million to the state. So when this is cut, 30%, it's pretty significant to us and to the state as a whole and to this population. And it cuts out at 185% of, oh, I should explain this. Um, could we have the next slide just for a second? Sure. Thanks. Let me go back to that. But <clears throat> there's sort of three measures that we have of ability to make ends meet. And the minimum wage is the one that we're looking at. and so. The minimum wage, working 40 hours full time a week, um, would end up being $21,840. 100% um, of the federal poverty level depends on the different on the household size. For one person, it's $12,000. For two people, it's 16, and for three people, it's 21. And the third thing is, if we could go back to the previous chart, thank you. The third thing is um, what we do as a state is to figure out the basic needs budget for each type of household. And so <clears throat> that's this black line at the top. So um, I managed to get these diamonds to show up this time. Um, this is 100% of federal poverty level for this household. This is 200 and this is 300. Most of these programs um, are geared to federal poverty level. So at 100% of federal poverty level, you get the full amount. And then it declines between usually 100 and 200%. So that's when we're seeing this problem here. So food stamps, um, we have sort of extended it, and it <clears throat> declines. It ends at 185% of federal poverty level. Um, I think the proposal is to do away with that, um, to make us stop at 130%. So it would affect us by the blue would cut out sooner. The, the federal proposal? I'm sorry, say that again? Are you talking about the federal proposal? Or the yeah. Federal? Okay. And it's a federal program. So yeah. we have used every power we could to um, extend what we can. Uh, but the discussion is to make the voluntary parts less flexible. So how would you, can you tell how many people that would affect that, that cut down? No, I understand that um, that Agency of Human Services hasn't figured it out yet quite. So unfortunately, we can't really do this, update this yet until we get a little closer. Um, 
let's see, the next one, the pink is earned income tax credit. Really important. Um, and this also phase out, phases out around the same point, 200% of federal poverty level. Um, and then ours is 32, to be, soon to be 35% of that. That's the purple at the top. And it's at the top because it's ours. We can do what we want with it. And let's see. Um, there are federal tax credits. This is child tax credits. This is Greenland. And then this big brown blob that goes all the way up is a combination of Medicaid and the exchange. OK, so at 185% of um, poverty level, you move off Medicaid. The parent does and go into the exchange so it's smaller. But it doesn't, it doesn't create a cliff. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the, this is broken into two pieces. One has, there's a federal premium subsidy, then there's the Vermont premium subsidy. There's the cost sharing, um, the Vermont uh, cost sharing. Um, let's see, reach up is very small it, because it, it's cut out very soon. Fuel assistance ends at about 185% of federal poverty level. That might be totally eliminated. The biggest one here that makes this family, um, this, this, this have this dip that we don't see in any of the other families is this green one here. And that's the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Okay, let her go through them. I've got other questions lined up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So um, that's really the reason that S40 decided to focus on this program um, <clears throat> when it was looking at dealing with the benefit clause. And part of the reason is that if people, people's wages increased, we put them in this category of seeing their child care subsidy decrease and their total benefits decreasing. Okay. Um, could you do the next slide? Sure. Oh, the one after the next slide. <clears throat> the next one after that. Okay. This is. Uh, so I want to be sure that you've gotten through your list, and then I've got two or three people with questions. So are you gonna are you going into more detail on one of these, or did you get through everything? I, I think I got through the, the list of all of our okay. different pieces. <clears throat> Definitely the big ones. Okay. So um, let's let's come back to this in a second, and I've got Cynthia Jim. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Jim, that's right. So. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, on your charts, we're assuming that, or you're assuming for the sake of making these up, that, that a family of whatever applies for all that's available to them. And some people don't for yeah. some reason. Do we have any information on percentage of families who do or don't apply for various? Or I'd have to ask somebody else probably. Um, any inclination? Uh, I could probably get it to you. Okay, for, I'm just curious. I mean, it, for each of these programs, mm. I used census data yeah. and compared it with enrollment. Okay. And you would look at census data and you would say these people are eligible. Yeah. But there may be other reasons um, okay. that they're not eligible. But it's definitely much. We have many people that look like from census data. They're eligible, yeah. but they don't. And enroll. one more specific question on, for instance, child care subsidy, CC, FAP. Um, that's based on current budget assumptions. I mean, what's in the House passed budget, and that kind of stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to understand the differences between the, the Vermont child care subsidy. Um, Can we go back to the other chart? The, the thanks. The uh, or the child dependent care, child care subsidy, which I think is daycare. Um, and there was a few other children ones here that child tax credit. And the, I think that's just a credit you get on yeah. taxes for yeah. taxes, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And federal child dependent care. I I wanted I just in my that's, mind I want okay. to just make clear the program. Right. right. I should have written tax credit. Um, the, but <coughs> child independent care, both Vermont and federal, are tax credits. And then um, child care subsidy is actually paying for child care. 
And it's a federal, there's federal money and state money in the child care subsidy. Child care subsidy is literally helping with daycare Pay, yeah. and paying for care of a child. And right. the others child are more tax related. It's not tax related, and it's money that actually goes to the child care provider. Okay. To pay for the child Whereas care. the itself. child dependent care one in. Those is, are credits. Yeah. And then there's a separate child tax credit as yes. well. Okay. Lots of little pieces. Yeah. Yeah, you would think we could. Yeah. <laughs> Do something simpler, right? Um, <clears throat> so could we get to the, I think the two, the EITC one, not the next one, but this one. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to show this one because I, I know this is tax again, and I know you about, know about the EITC, but not so much to see it as a picture and how it fits in. Okay, so. Is this um, federal or state? Well, it, the picture's going to be the same because we're a percentage. Say that again? We're a percentage of this, yeah. yeah. So, so this is the federal, the, right? This is the federal, and ours looks exactly the it same. It looks exactly the same. <clears throat> we just tag on to this. So you have, again, income increasing across the bottom, and um, then you have the credit amount increasing this way. And so this was unlike the other ones where you get 100% of the benefit at 100% of federal poverty level, and then it declines. This was designed as an incentive to work. So you start with zero, and then the more you work and the more you earn, the more your credit is. And the amount it depends on the number of children that you have. So looking at the top one, which is three children, um, as you go from zero to 14,000, in income, for every dollar you earn, you're actually getting an extra 45 cents from this credit. And then there's sort of a plateau range where your income's between 14,000 and 18. Um, and then at that point, it phases out. And so for every dollar that you earn, you're losing 21 cents on this. But you're losing 21 cents of the subsidy. 21 cents of the credit. Of the credit. Yes, not a, you keep your no, dollar. Yeah, uh, keep your dollar. Just, but the problem is, when you, that dollar that you've, well, maybe I should just say, then we've got the um, Vermont one on top of this, and if it's 35%, you'd end up losing 28 cents for each dollar that you earn. But you would, okay. you would, have, you would have gotten more. You would have started more, with more. You so would have gotten more, and then you would have lost more. So, so yeah. yeah. Um, but then you think about it, you add this to the other pieces, and uh, food stamps, uh, SNAP, for the general thing is for every dollar um, that you earn, you lose 24 cents. Um, you know, so you sort of, you add these pieces together, and you, know, you see how you end up uh, going backwards. And, and so I think, in terms of the addressing that the, the um, slope, I'm calling it a cliff, the more effective way to use the earned income tax credit would be to extend this plateau yeah. um, to that address would, that. That, that would decouple us from the federal yeah. system. Yeah, it's yeah, complicated. We, it would be better if the federal system did that. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, could you do the next one? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so this is the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. And so for every, almost all of the programs, like say food stamps, they first determine an, what it costs to meet that need, and then the two parts. You determine how much it costs, and then you determine how much each family gets based on their family income. So for Child Care Financial Assistance Program, people always say, well, how much do they get in the subsidy? And it depends on whether it's an infant, toddler, preschool, or school-aged <coughs> child, and then it depends on whether you need full-time, part-time extended care, and then it depends on this quality rating of the type of facility that you're in. But if you took an infant and say it was a three-star facility and full-time, it would be $180.43 a week is currently 
what our maximum subsidy would be. Next one. Um, and then this is how you figure out how much of that you would get. Again, we've got income across the bottom, but in this case, it's a percent of federal poverty level. And then this is the percent of the maximum that you would get. And so at 100% federal poverty level, you get 100% of the subsidy. At 150% of federal poverty level, you would get 60% of the subsidy. Next one. So for an example, 20, um, an, this is a single parent with one child, an infant, $23,000 income, they're at 95%. The maximum state payment is 180 a week. They get 95% of that, 171. This is what they get in a year. If their income increased by 2.75%, it would go up to this, but they get 90% of the subsidy. So that would be 162 a week. That would be 8,444 a year. So they would gain 633 in income and lose $469 in childcare subsidy. Wow. Next one which is okay until you combine it with all of the other, other programs. So what happens then at the bottom line becomes you gain 633 in income and you lose 765 in benefits. Do the next one. So this is the proposal that's in S40. And it's simply to take that, the sliding scale chart and move it over <coughs> to the right so that you, at 100%, let's say your income goes up because of the minimum wage um, to 110%. So we've moved the slope over 10%, so you would still get 100% of the subsidy, no change. Um, at 150%, your income goes up to say 160%, so you go up now to the purple line and you still get 60% of the subsidy, no change. And so this is when you combine it with everything else, all the other benefits. Um, <clears throat> bottom line is you're still gaining 633 in income, but you're only losing 436 in the child care subsidy. Yeah, okay. um, I know this is not um, the topic that you're presenting on, but m my recollection is that the CCFAP program has another, another issue with the minimum wage in that it would put upper pressure on the child care workers, which might increase their costs, which might mean that a subsidy would not actually buy as much. And I know this is not the essence of your presentation, but am I correct that there's that issue as well? Yes, you're correct. And when we estimated the cost as it in steps, as it yes. goes out, we did you incorporate that. Into that. Excellent. But there's an yet another piece, Okay. and that is that that schedule that I showed you, you know, with $180 um, as the maximum subsidy, yes. Yes. that's based on a market study that's way old. So that rate isn't current. Okay, isn't and, so, and this would have budgetary implications. The, both of them, both moving the slot, moving the scale out and dealing with the market. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank Did you. you do the next one? Yeah. So, um, so that proposal was in S40 as it passed the Senate, and the other part was like, it was like fund CFAP as necessary, or like if money becomes available magically, um, that, yes, that, you, that, that's for funding the child care workers as opposed to... If you could to, show the um, next, I think I've got the language in here. Oh, uh, the next, yes, okay, here we go. So the two pieces are the sliding scale and also the market rate. And all this bill though is asking for is to up the market rate as wages go up. It hasn't addressed that fundamental gap that we have between, um, I, I understand there's a brand new study, is that correct? That's out for 2017 market rates? It's not out yet. It'll be out in. Okay, all right. But anyway, um, <clears throat> We're substantially behind. The market rate is substantially behind. That has not been addressed. Without, without the bill, even if we didn't change the bill. Is that right? Yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Even if we, we didn't change anything, yeah. the, um, the market rates, 
that we're using. We're out of date. Yeah, we're out of date. And what is the, the, the moving the sliding scale as a cost? Right? And that's factored into the vote. Yes. So the one prior to that has the cost. I'm sorry. That's all right. Thank you. Okay, so this column here is what we've estimated um, to be the cost for each of the steps in the minimum wage bill. And um, it goes up because you're bringing in more people, at, you know, as well as there being um, more workers are getting a raise. Bringing in more people to the program? Bring, more people are participating. It's, is the estimate, and this is this is really the wild card, is how we anticipate getting back to your question. Oh, because of the moving the sliding, you move the sliding scale, so no more people. Well, when we move the sliding scale over, not only are the the people who um, you know get that that equivalent wage increase will be in the same place, but somebody who doesn't get a wage increase suddenly goes, oh, it's a better deal than it was before. And who those people are, and when they're when. We don't know. Okay. Thank you. That's that's the wild card. We tried to estimate it by looking at um, if the subsidy percentage is a certain amount, how many of the eligible people come in, and then as the subsidy increased, we would you know apply that to them. But this is only to twelve ninety five. It's not to fifteen. Uh, this is an eighteen dollars. So, so it's is, real. This is this yeah. This is these are nominal dollars. I'm, I'm sorry. That is the fifteen dollar. That's these are the twenty eighteen dollars. These are real dollars. Okay, so the nominal cost would be higher. I mean, all correct. of these things. Okay, it really should say that somewhere. I don't see. Yeah, you're you know. right. It, it should say they're all in twenty eighteen dollars, not just the minimum wage. I know. So that all the budget dollars, yeah. when you get to twenty four, it's not going to be seventeen point five. It's going to be you know twenty five or something. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. You're right, I should put that on the top. Sorry, I'm very obsessive about that. <laughs> Actually, I am too. I'm surprised I didn't write it, but. <laughs> you knew what you meant. <laughs> um, so I tried to like rush through this so that you could get like a flavor of what's happening. Right. Um, but it looks like I have five minutes if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone have any questions? It was very helpful. Yeah, very helpful. So in terms of the going all the way to the fifteen dollars, is there is there an I don't, I don't know, is there is there a point at which as the rates go up there becomes a bigger problem? I mean it, in some ways could there be a better stop be a better point to stop than fifteen dollars? Um, in terms of maximizing everybody's benefit? It's a good question. I, I read um, in one state that they found that there was like this sweet spot, right. and I didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's clear, they, well, um, I didn't explain this other column, the first column on that, which is that um, Tom can pick up from here, <laughs> but we do gain some state revenue in the process, and so the idea was to take as much of that state revenue as we could to address this issue. And a lot of that comes from Medicaid, when people are moving off of Medicaid um, and onto the exchange. Some of it comes from increased income taxes, reduced EITC, reduced other benefits um, and if there's a most of that is you know pretty much of a line if there's a jump in that I guess it's getting off of Medicaid because that just takes it, uh, it frees up state money in a you know big Yes, as that's you the parent work. getting off, right? The yes. children stay on Dr. Dinosaur right. or whatever, but the parent gets off and that's the... The parent gets off and um, although there may be cuts to, doc, uh, to the Dr. Dinosaur, that we don't know about, but the they, would, they would stay on to 317% of federal poverty level so that they're not 
it's not an issue for them. But getting the parent off Medicaid when they go off, it saves a chunk of money to the state. Okay. Just off the top of your head, it was in your presentation, but um, you know, 1295 and 2024. Do you know, remember what it would be just under the current indexed? In it's, it's in the, it's the, the memos. memos. It's in the memos. Thank it's, you. A, it's in what Joyce presented. Yeah. 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 I can't remember. What, 20, it would be 1216. 1216. Wait, that's, it, it, that's, in, that's nominal. Um, yeah. yeah. Ooh, you know. oh, okay. It's in one of these memos. Do you have all these numbers in your head? 2024. Yeah, 1220 with the current inflation assumptions, but those are a little dated. Nominal? Yeah. That sounds right. 1220. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Come on, <coughs> How are you? Well, how are you? <laughs> Minimum wage. Yeah, minimum wage. So um, I've circulated a bunch of documents that have been written over the last year on this in anticipation of more just of a Q&A session with you all. Uh, the work we did on this goes back to 1999, like Deb. Um, and the analysis that had been done was really different than we started doing in 1999 from most other minimum wage analysis, mostly by virtue of the work that Deb did, that looked at not just like, well, what's the minimum wage increase going to be, but what's the effect on the income of the people that you're trying to help? And if you're taking away benefits that are worth more than the wage gains, you're not really ending up in a better place, and therefore policy needed to address that as well as anything with the wages. And the work that Deb did to get at that was phenomenal and has continued to do because she has to go through all of the various programs, see where the, you know, where the levels are, where people come in and out and this sort of thing, and then calculate that. And, um, and she's done that. But there are very few other state level minimum wage studies you'll see that do that kind of work. And um, it also then affects federal money and, of course, state fiscal impacts as well. So, um, uh, you know, that's been a part of all the minimum wage analysis we've done. Uh, it's been updated several times uh, for different wage levels over, over the years. And most of those increases uh, that have been approved in the past, I would describe as being relatively modest. Um, they've been at or close to sort of prevailing wage levels, so they sort of kept up with that. And uh, what that tends to do is sweep uh, sort of everybody into a minimum wage category. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, there are, when we look at New Hampshire, uh, uh, minimum or low wage workers in New Hampshire, uh, and I think we talked about this once before in, in this committee, but um, we did sort of a cursory analysis of who are the workers that are below the Vermont minimum wage in 2015 in New Hampshire, and they were 70 percent women. Uh, it was a fairly substantial portion of the labor force, like 13 percent of the labor force, uh, but those are sort of the workers that even if the prevailing wage is above the minimum wage, they don't really get swept up. They don't, you know, they're not squeaky wheels or they're not looking for other jobs or whatever. And so they stay below the minimum wage. Um, and and that, was, uh, that was an interesting uh, uh, finding looking at that. But what we did in this last analysis for the summer uh, uh, study committee was we, we did analyses of sort of stakes in the ground, not knowing what they were going to end up at and sort of took the most aggressive, which was $15 in 2022. Yeah, yeah 2022. And uh, then the least aggressive was 1250 in 2021. And, and then did an in-between one also. But we didn't do an analysis that's, that's 
what's now in statute. So I can't really put numbers on that. You mean what's now in the bill? Yeah, what's now in the bill. 2024. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. So uh, it's a little bit below the the more extreme stake and kind of in line with the second stake, but further, and uh, quite a bit above the, the bottom stake. So um, joint fiscal has done some, uh, you know, using those stakes in the ground, has done some estimates in between those. And I think they're reasonable, but they're not numbers that we produce, so I can't really speak to those. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about, um, you know, general, general issues around it. I mean, I think this issue is both economic, and we always run these big models and factor in a zillion different things and try to estimate efficiency wage responses and you know we calculate down to the last <coughs> worker how many workers there are make all these adjustments by industry and all the rest but I think it's both an economic issue and there's a big non-economic aspect to this you know if I were to have run these kind of economic models on uh, child labor laws when they were put into effect you would have had negative economic impacts coming from that short term anyway. I mean, if you did long term, obviously, you get societal gains and, you know, better labor force, better educated labor force and all the rest. But uh, minimum wage laws are really enacted uh, largely as sort of more like a, a societal standard or a labor standard more than saying, oh, this is going to stimulate the economy. Um, and uh, as you get into the higher wage increases, which these are, these are above what's been studied in the literature uh, uh, in the past, it's you get increasingly uncertain impacts. Because there's nothing I can peg to that and say, oh yeah, this happened in uh, Nebraska a few years ago, and they analyze it, and here's the result. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it, this is above those levels. So, uh, so one of the things that, um, and tell me if I'm, if I'm seeing this wrong, but um, because this goes out to 2024, we're having to make assumptions about tax policy and about inflation yeah. that at some point are guesswork. Um, uh, the, the farther out you go, the wider your confidence right. interval is. And so that so it, when somebody looks at these studies, they think, oh my god, we're going to lose 1,232, I don't know if you remember what the numbers are, Whatever it is. jobs, and there's going to be a, a you know, some it looks as though we're able to quantify all the impacts, mm -hmm. um, but it feels the one thing you've touched on. We can't quantify the social benefit, um, which is one of the. I think you're correct in pointing out that that's one of the reasons why some of us would support an increase. Um, so that doesn't get quantified, and that the other is that when you're projecting that far out, um, you're projecting on the basis of assumptions that are we just aren't tested. Um, we just don't know. Yeah, so some things are easy to forecast and sure. some things aren't. Yeah. And we could provide a, a band. But even since we did the analysis, we were using, in order to keep these studies consistent over time, we were using inflation assumptions from December of 2016. So that was what was being used going out into the future. Since then, uh, those inflation forecasts have gone up. So. Um, and, and also, the passage of this tax act uh, is really juicing the economy in a way that is driving down, will drive down unemployment even more and will provide upward pressure on wages. No so it's, yeah. yeah, so it's very likely, I mean, already you're hearing a lot of stories about labor shortages and, yeah. and we're finally seeing some wage increase just from these market factors. So. It's likely that the prevailing wage will be higher than we thought when the analysis was done, and so a nominal $15 rate probably would have less negative impact than was estimated, you know, back then. Um, and um, you know, aside from the societal side of it as well, I mean, even though there are. You know, there are job losses as you raise the price of an input to production, there's going to be less of it used. If you, it, it represents, I think, in, in our uh, more extreme case, something in the neighborhood of 3% of all minimum wage jobs would, would, you know, you'd have a loss of jobs. Um, 
I think if you put it to a vote from the minimum wage workers and said you have a 97 percent chance of of getting a pay increase or a three percent chance of losing your job or having hours reduced such you have less income um, I think many given the hopelessness of some of the situations they're in would would readily vote for that um, you know the, the the lottery tax is paid largely disproportionately by low-income people and in some ways that's more uh, uh, more a purchase of hope than anything else because statistically it makes no sense. Joint fiscal sometimes refers to the lottery uh, tax as the tax on the mathematically challenged because it is, you know, I mean, you just really, it's, it's not a wise investment. It doesn't, you know, the chances are so low that you'll win, but, but there's a hope. There's, there's some hope. And I think uh, with a lot of people, they would not stand to get much of an increase absent something like this. And so uh, it might be that, you know, it would still be advantageous. Anyway. Sam, Cynthia, and John. When you were doing that, it's a little harder to look forward, but look, did you look at the minimum wage increases that we just went through in order I mean, what the effects were on the economy? You know, this is something I recommend, uh, and and it's not in the not in the legislation now. But but Senate Economic Development asked us to do, you know, sort of what we recommend. There's just a, a two pager that's one of the handout things that you know that calls for monitoring and studying some of the effects. I mean, we have a situation now uh, with with New Hampshire, and I think there's a chart somewhere in here. This is page six of the October memo, though. It shows the differential between Vermont and, and New Hampshire. And there's been now about a 15-year period where there's been a pretty significant uh, departure uh, in the two states. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it doesn't look like there's anything on the cusp in New Hampshire of changing. So they're at the federal minimum wage. And, and over this 15-year period that there's been a pretty pronounced differential, you would expect to start to see some differences and, and impacts. Differences. And well, perhaps in, in economic development in certain sectors that rely on low-income workers, on wage distributions, on uh, you know, things like this gender split that we saw just in doing a cursory analysis of the data. But I think it would be interesting to dig deep, more deeply into that and to monitor if you decide to go ahead with further increases, to have your pulse on that and also study more rigorously what the impacts are. You've probably seen these Seattle uh, studies, um, and it's, it's not yet $15 that's been studied, but $13. And, and uh, they're competing interpretations of the data right now, but as more data come in, it'll be clear what's going on. But it at least provides some basis for understanding what's really happening, especially when we're in uncharted territory. So I, I would recommend doing that sort of thing if you can. So one of the things that I, um, you know, six years seems like a, a, a long way away to plan for me, and you know, yeah. $15 is the magic number. To my way of thinking, it seems to make a little bit more sense to like go three years, see where you're at, rather than. Yeah, there have been states that have done things with a longer term thing, but then had check ins, you know. So like, there's a check in in a year or two years, and say, well, let's let's look at it, and is it having negative effects, or is it is it nothing? Could we go faster? Should we go slower? Um, I think those sort of things would make sense given the uncertainty out there. I, I know there's a desire to have a particular number show up somewhere, but uh, that kind of flexibility doesn't seem unreasonable. And in, in your looking at this, did you look at any of like the impacts of the rural areas versus urban areas? Is it different? Yeah, we didn't break that out. Okay. So we didn't do any sub-state analysis either. So um, I know, Cynthia, you were interested in that. And 
Uh, we looked at it by industry. All the modeling was done at the state level. Um, so we're trying to identify vulnerable industries and you know uh, vulnerable occupations and things like that. But um, you know, prevailing wages will be uh, lower in some of these rural areas. So. Uh, there would be more of an increase, and there's some states that have done well. New York, for example, you know, has these differential ones. You know, there's always a trade-off with the complexity of, you know, laws like that, and uh, uh, you know, both for enforcement and simplicity and all the rest. Um, but uh, I'm just not sure if the rising tide's going to raise all boats or sink some. <laughs> It's, it, there, there is a very different, very divergent economic situation in most states between urban areas and rural areas, and that's been more pronounced in this recovery than in prior. Um, what you say about monitoring the economic impact is really important to me, and we've only just finished the, pers the uh, statutory increases in the minimum wage this past January. So one of my concerns about going forward is the question of what are the impacts of what we've already done and make sure we understand that before we go further. And some people are saying, well, we don't see any negative income, so we can do more. The f even if negative impact, even if there isn't a negative impact, and I don't know that, that doesn't mean there wouldn't be one from going further because according to the figures in one of these studies, we would end up from 2014 to 2015 with a 45% increase in real wage and a 72% increase in nominal wage, and there are no real-world experiments of that magnitude change that fast. So I think the idea of putting in economic monitoring but going ahead with further increases anyway is, is really faulty to me. We've just, we've already increased it, and I voted for that increase. We've increased it, and we'll still be adjusting for inflation. But we should study, we should hit the pause button and study before we go on and do more. I, I really think it's irresponsible. I also have a question. In understanding how you do, you measure these net job losses, because it'll say 200 a year, or 304, or 950. And Joyce, I think, she's not here, said it was as if, this is this is where the jobs might the job line might have been across time, the employment line. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't increased it, and then there's a lower line that you know you have a small divergence, and then it gets bigger and bigger as um, business owners substitute out of labor into capital or whatever is happening. It gets bigger and bigger, so, and then stabilizes. And then stabilizes. And so the question is, when one says 200 the first year, 350, 950, 2800 long term. <laughs> Are, are you measuring the same jobs and then adding more job loss, more or are those or are these new jobs being lost? I don't understand. No, it's just a difference. So it's like a constant number. So, it's so relative it's like, to where you would have that's been. That's what I thought. That's right. That's so what it I goes, thought. Okay. and and the effects are lagged. So you're right. Yes. So even if you were to measure, what are the effects of this last set of increases? You know, yeah. the changes in January of this year, um, that would. That would take a while to fully play out if you're measuring it, because you don't have these instantaneous responses from... Well, you might have adjustment of hours, but maybe not jobs. Yeah, but even that often doesn't it's happen wrong. immediately. You know, you'll get the change, and then they'll try to pass prices on. If you can't pass prices on, then what do you do? And, you know, yeah. I, I think it's ended up, be, just as the way markets have worked out, I think it stayed pretty close to the prevailing wage. So I, that, that's why I don't think you would find huge impacts. From what we've done. From what we've done so but far. But not necessarily what Not necessarily. Like I said, that's in uncharted territory. Then, but, and the other, the other yeah. question is, um, my, another of my problems with going further with the minimum wage is that if we're in an economic expansion, which we are right now, yeah. the market is increasing the wage, there's pre upward pressure on the wage anyway. If we go into a recession, which we will at some point, because yeah. we always do, yeah. Having a higher minimum wage will mean more recessionary job losses, and I don't know if that is factored into what you what the model projects at all. Is it just pre projecting the job losses if we have an expansionary economy the whole time? Because if you're intervening in the labor market and having you know setting a higher wage, um, when you go into a recession, chances are you're going to have more job losses. So is that factored into the net increase in revenue that's projected? Is that factored into the job losses? And this gets into the question of the assumptions underlying the model's yeah. projection. So, so these are good points, but there's not a, a, a cycle imposed on this, on this job loss number or this trend mm -hmm. 
uh, a number that the Remy model would use. But that work that that goes both ways. Okay. So you would have less negative impact In like now, and right. it's and there's right. and it looks more boomy busty the way it's okay. shaping up. Okay. You know, it had been this very slow, steady, you know, recovery yeah. without it, very underwhelming recovery. But because it was underwhelming, there were no imbalances that were developing really in the economy. Right. So there was no reason to have a recession to correct something. Right. Now mm -hmm. you're starting to get pressures that look a lot more like that. Even in housing, you're seeing price increases in some mountain and western states that are, you know, 10, 12 percent a year. Yeah. That can't that can't continue, you know. It, 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 it'll go for a while, but you know that there will be regional busts that are going to happen. It's not going to happen here because we've hardly come back, you know, just a little bit above the peak levels we were at before. But this is, but that that would go both ways. So you would have less impact as the economy is booming, and then in a, in a recession, yeah, it would swing below. But it would be if you were to sort of long term average, it would still be close to that number. Okay. Uh, in terms of how it works. It's not a cyclical model. One of the things that I'm having trouble understanding, perhaps you can help me, that um, this idea of, of looking looking back and monitoring, you know, going out three years and then figuring out where we are and how many jobs we're losing and then deciding again, how do you, when you're looking back and doing that kind of evaluation, how do you control for other factors, for it, things like, um, I don't know, you've named, you've named a bunch of them. But, yeah, um, it's hard. It's really hard because it's not a perfect experiment. It's not like some petri dish and you isolate <laughs> wages and everything else right. stays the same. Can you control for other factors? Well, you, you, yeah, you can look at other places that are similar and say, well, what happened there? Oh, so they're yeah. just, it, it's direction, indication. That's what all these academic studies have tried to do in different right. ways. But their thing, it, it's not like you'll come up with a definitive number and say, this is how many jobs were lost because of the minimum wage. It's just that you can say there's been a noticeable decline in hours worked for low wage workers. And that didn't happen in New Hampshire or didn't happen in some other place that's very similar in terms of a lot of other conditions. Um, you could look county by county, then some state level stuff. It just starts to paint a picture of like, is there economic distress that's localized in the places that we expect there to be if if it was caused by the minimum wage. There are a lot of other factors, and you can't get rid of all of those. Okay. You, you, can, you can try to model them, and you can try to put those in, but there are a lot of other things happen. It's not like it's going to be perfect, but it would give you some indication. It uh, might give us some indication. Yeah, I, I, I think you would get some guidance, but it's not going to be down to the tenth decimal, or it's not going to be down, you know, the, the, it's going to be plus or minus something, but you'll know is it negative or positive? Is it large? Is it, you know, well, we trivial? We'd only get some, dial some guidance if there was a difference. What? Well, yeah. If everything looked the same. Well, then that would be guidance too. It's like there's there's not any difference. So this is not. That would suggest that it's very close to prevailing wages, yeah. and and it wouldn't have really made much difference. Um, although you do get this effect in places that don't have the minimum wage, where there's still a class that ends up getting sub-minimum wage uh, uh Joey Curtin. Um, I just, I've heard um, people remark that this is going to um, have a negative impact on Vermont businesses, small businesses, if we raise the minimum wage. Can you comment on that? Um, there are some sectors that will be heavily influenced. So uh, to the extent that a business can't pass the costs on, it creates pressure. So if you're an export-oriented business that is competing with a, a political jurisdiction that doesn't have any minimum wage, and labor is a big part of the total production cost, then you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage, and it will be very hard to swallow enough of the costs through profit or through efficiencies or things like that. To, to stay so, in business. To interpret what you're saying, is this going to be a problem along the New Hampshire border? Uh, it, it, it could be more of a problem on the New Hampshire border than some places, but if this is, say, say it's a, a business, um, you know, a manufacturing business, it wouldn't matter where in the state it was. It's not like you get the drink. And 
And in a lot of these sectors, like take retail, which is one of the sectors that's low wage, um, you already have a big differential with New Hampshire by virtue of other laws that are in place, like Act 250, which mm -hmm. limited the development of big box type stores, uh, a lower or non-existent sales tax, which also affected the retail sector and, and where those establishments are built. But then you also have much more job loss recently in the big box sector as a result of internet competition, and that's hitting New Hampshire way harder than it's hitting Vermont because all those stores went there, all the so brick and mortar was over there. Uh, so you have all these other things that are going on at the same time. Now, people can also work in New Hampshire very easily and live in Vermont and go across the border and still get a job. People shop across the border. The development of those stores also involves construction firms that are in Vermont as well as New Hampshire. So it's not like there's, you know, everything's just cleanly on one side or the other. But you'd have to look at it sector by sector. The, the industries that are most vulnerable are those that can't pass the, the, the cost on and have a high share of labor cost. So if you're competing like, you know, in some industries, it's you can pass costs on and all your competitors are having to do the same thing. So you're not at much of a disadvantage. You'll get a little bit less demand just because the overall price will go up a little bit, but usually it's a fairly small number. Um, that's really where the vulnerability exists. Yeah. And that's almost company by company. It's not just, you can't just say it's all small business or, or you know, everybody even in one sector. Thanks. Um, Tom, the Seattle uh, study, is there a, I many of you have seen this, but is there a link to the, the studies of, I know you said there's two yeah, there are two sets of data. Yeah, one's the University of Washington, I think, was the one that was hired by the state to analyze the data, and then there was a Berkeley group. Do you have that, a link you can send to that? Or? I, I can do that, or if there's anybody from Joint Fiscal in the room, they can do okay. that too. I know they can. What, what, looking at those, what do we take from like completely different yeah, takes on, on, on that? Just that one looks at it in a more conservative way, and one looks at it in a more liberal way, or no? Because the, I mean, the the, the Berkeley group has a track record of supporting minimum wage increases, so uh, uh, you know that's important to know before you know. But they're also well-respected academics, so it's not like they're pulling data that don't exist. It's that the data is. Uh, the initial data out isn't that robust. It's not the whole data set, and and it's also in a sub-state region. So it's really hard to get economic data that's in a, a small city. region. So you've got some chain stores, for example, that report information not by each store's location, but by the whole, okay. all of their stores and things like that. So there, there's some technical issues that make it hard to, okay. to say definitively. But the more data that come in, it'll be harder to disagree on a lot of the basic things. Co so, yeah. A couple more quick things. Yeah. Total number of minimum, minimum wage workers in Vermont is? I, it's in the It's in the report. Yeah, it's in the report. Okay, report. See, because we didn't do the one that's for the legislation that's pending, I. I, I laid it out for all the stakes we put in the ground, but that's different. And when, with that number, does that include tipped employees? Uh, it does include... In that number? I, it should, because there's a minimum wage. It does tip include tipped employees. employees. They're included as part of that minimum wage. Um, let me ask Matt. Uh, in the data you provided us by sector, tipped employees show up as part of the job counts, and the wage level in the occupational employment data would be absent tips with tips. Matt Berowitz, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, the source of the information which is generating this is occupational data collected by firms, and we do in the instructions, ask employers to report out tips. But as it relates to tipped wages, 
We do believe that many employers underreport because they do not fully understand the tips being realized, like if you leave cash versus if you leave credit cards. We do believe that the data is improving, but we do see some serious discrepancies. Um, so it is meant to capture tips. How well it does that is a question. So this is a data issue, but conceptually it's in there. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're included in that number. Yeah. Uh, one more quick one is you talk about New Hampshire and that we should really take a, a really close look at what the impacts are of their 725 minimum wage versus how it impacts us. What would we be looking at for for how it impacts us on? So a lot of the minimum wage studies that have been done tried to look at border areas of states that increase the minimum wage and then so all the counties you know that are adjacent to states that did and did not increase their minimum wage and then tries to say either they'll look at one sector like uh, like restaurants or something like that and say what happened you know did was there a whole lot more hiring here with the job loss over here relative to the two sides? So you think like, all right, this is a sector that's likely to have high impact. What happened? Were there fewer jobs or more jobs or things like that? So you're trying to look at things that are differences between both immediate counties and then if there's better data at the state level because there's more information, is there anything even at a state level that can give you some guidance as to that? Um, so it's it's trying to identify things that are happening as a result of it that could be considered and, positive. And we have not done that. We haven't done that. I mean, we did this cursory look at uh, the New Hampshire uh, wage data. It's in the February second memo that was or February eighth memo that was passed out as part of this set. And uh, there's a table in that towards the end of that, and it and it just shows what you know of. Uh, uh, first pass look at, at New Hampshire data and how it differs from Vermont. Um, but it, it, you could go a lot further. It's page six of the, um, the memo, so this table. George. <laughs> Let me be a simple surgeon for a minute. <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when you're going to decide about operating on somebody, you have to operate on it, you have to take the information that you have, even though imperfect, right. and you have to look at the risks you understand, even though you, there may be additional risks that you don't know about, right. and you have to weigh those two things, and you got a binary choice. You either operate or you don't operate, and it's a little bit similar. Bill's going to, if assuming it comes in here, each one of us is going to have to make a choice. Do we <laughs> vote for increased minimum wage or, or not, based on uh, admittedly imperfect information, admittedly unknown uh, uncharted territory that we're going into. If you were our economic surgeon, <laughs> would you advise us, advise us to have this procedure or not? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to have to like. You can't do that, Doc. You got to decide. You got to decide. The, 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 yeah. the patient's no, but, suffering. Yeah, no, no, no. But uh, what uh, what I can talk about are some of the risks. Yeah. Um, but uh, but. But as I said, it's not just an economic issue, and that's why I think it's it, there is a political realm to this. There is something that says, uh, you know, are there societal standards that we want to uh, state as a community, as a society, that you know that say there's a dignity to work that such that you know, a, 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 even the lowest level worker gets this amount of pay, you know. So, so that, that's a consideration that's outside of what I've analyzed and isn't really, I mean, it is something I think each of you have to weigh yourselves. I mean, that, that is what this deliberative process is about. Um, from just the economic risks, I, I think the way the economy is going right now your risks are low in the near term because the prevailing wage is going to stay ahead of or be very close to it. But it is increasingly uncertain the further out you get. And you don't have to do the whole operation today. You know, so you do have choices about timing. And, um, and either you can get more information along the way and have a better idea. Uh, you can 
you know, you, you can chart it out. It would be good to have some flexibility probably around that, but, um, uh, but there are, are reasons maybe also to say this is where we're going and that's it, but those would be more political than economic. So. George yeah. is operating. What's that? He's doing the operation. He's doing the operation. All right. Yeah. Wait, first do no harm. That. First do no harm. He can't operate if you it's not refuse to do any harm. You just yeah. You're going to cut the skin no matter what. Right? But it's not an emergency. Yeah. yeah. For a little. Some people. Yeah. That's not much to do. Yeah. Yes, and they may lose their jobs, and the odds of losing your job in Benton hey. County will be higher. So, Fred has to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. If he gets a chance. <laughs> um, do you have any stats, or are there, on the relationship between minimum wage increases and state GDP, especially in instances where the minimum wage is going up than what the projected gross domestic product would be for a state, and what the implications of that are, if any? Um, I haven't <coughs> seen analysis that go so far as to say there would be measurable GSP changes from prior minimum wage increases at any state. Uh, there's so many other things that affect gross state product far, far more than minimum wage changes. And some of the states with relatively high wages have had very strong, robust growth. Mm -hmm. And some states with no minimum wage with the federal have had, you know, very slow growth, but there, there's so many other factors that are more important than that, uh, that I don't think you would get statistical reliability, even if you ran all the states and did it over a control period. The other thing is that even the gross state product numbers are squishy numbers. They're, I mean, they're estimated numbers too. and. There have been massive revisions in gross state product estimates in the last five years, to the point where, in some years, Vermont's gross state product, the sign even changed from going up to going down and from going down to going up in a particular year. So, uh, you know, well, it's good to look at that as an overall metric. I don't think that would be a definitive sort of statistical test as to whether a minimum wage change. Uh, was necessarily good or bad for the economy. As you get to higher minimum wage changes, you would expect there to be some negative impact on gross state product because you, you would have less economic activity from really, if you were to raise the minimum wage to $25 an hour tomorrow, you would have a negative Im impact on GSP. And I don't think any economist would argue that you wouldn't uh, or, or not a credible economist. But when you're in between and when you're close to prevailing wages and things like that, um, it's, it's, it's probably unlikely you'd have a measurable negative impact. <coughs> so does that answer? Yeah, well, I was just curious. Yeah. There was. Yeah. <coughs> no, I haven't seen a, a, you know, the studies that are trying to look at impacts are usually looking at sectors that are highly likely to be you know, have a lot of minimum wage workers, yeah, and be vulnerable, and say, well, has anything happened there? And if you don't see it there, then you're unlikely to see it elsewhere. Um, the fact is, too, we've lost a lot of the manufacturing firms that rely on low wage labor. They've already been out competed by, you know, Mexico and China and other places. So, you know, those in some ways are the most vulnerable. Um, Industries that tend to compete with other, you know, local sort of other local industries are all going to be under the same pressure, and a price increase will probably stick for the most part. But things like export, as you were referring to. Yeah, if you're a furniture manufacturer, there's a really high labor comp component, and you're doing a lot of stuff by hand. It's not all mechanized and this sort of thing. Contract manufacturers would be another category of potential. Yeah, it depends. It, it just depends on, yeah, are you using low wage? When we look at manufacturing in general, the companies that are left are super productive. They're using a lot of capital. Their workers are fairly highly paid. Very few of them hit the minimum wage, you know, show up in the, in the data here. 
So I'm going to uh, ask, give Cynthia a chance to ask your question. Um, I don't understand why you didn't look at regional effects because you talk about 97%, 3%. Those might be the odds overall in the state, but those are not the odds in Bennington County. Those are not the odds in the Northeast Kingdom. If you're talking about losing 200 jobs the first year, what if 100 of them are in the Northeast Kingdom and 100 of them are in Bennington County? Those are significant job losses. I was talking to a single mother last week. It wasn't about this. It was about the stupid motor vehicle inspections. Yeah. We're doing something about that. Yeah. She cannot lose her job. If she loses her job, her economic life is destroyed sure. and she has to go fully on benefits. So I think the way, the, the failure to fully weight the impact of losing the jobs on the people that lose them against the increases for the other people and the failure to do regional analysis is such a grave flaw in your study that it, it isn't even, it's not as useful to me as it, as it could be. Because you yourself have been showing us the fact that the economic development is localized in the state and the rest of the state has stagnated. And the rest of the state is probably where a lot of this impact is going to be. And I think that's, it really, just forget about all the ideas about rural economic development because you're doing this and you're making it harder for the businesses that are there to succeed and function. And again, I'm not opposed to doing this at some point, but you've already operated three times, George. You want to operate again when there's no emergency? I don't think so. So the, the, the monitoring would be a good thing to do, but let's hit the pause button because 200 jobs, 2,000 jobs, 1,000 less in the Northeast Kingdom and 1,000 less in Bennington County, that's a big deal. That's 2,000 single mothers. And I just, I just find the lack of regional analysis just cripples the usefulness of what you've done here. The other, the other comment I have is that when you're looking at, at increases in income to minimum wage workers, do you net out the loss of income from the employed people? You do? Yeah, yes, okay. we do. And, and let me just say, I would be very happy to do sub-state analysis on this. I would, I would uh, if asked to do that, I, that would be really interesting and and uh, uh, productive work. We don't have uh, the same model at the county level, but right. it's available, so we could buy it and develop the same sort of thing. We don't have the same level of data detail, uh, Matt, at the county level, but we could maybe do some bridging and stuff and come up with something. I don't know. It, it would be a. It, it is much more complex to do analysis at the county level than the state level because there is there is so much less data and it's so much less timely mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it can't be done and it would be great to do it at that level and it would be great to include surrounding states so that we could look at border counties and have models set up like that mm -hmm. that's not a cheap exercise but it's it would be really interesting and we do lots of uh, both city level analyses for uh, 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 for others, we haven't done minimum wage studies uh, uh, elsewhere, but we do lots of other uh, economic analyses uh, at the county level, uh, and even some at zip code levels and things like that. Okay. But um, yeah, but you, weren't, you, you, weren't you tell us to do, to do that, and I'd be happy. No, that. nobody else. Okay, then that's yeah. Important. No, I I would have been, and it would be expensive. It's It'd not a it it's not an yeah. easy cheap right. thing to do, but it's certainly doable when we do these sort of things. Uh, in lots of other areas. So uh, give us a green light and we would be happy to do that. So three more people lined up here, Jim Hess and George Well, with regards to this topic, regional analysis, I was thinking in my head as Cynthia was talking about the difference between, or similarities, on one hand, Bennington, Brattleboro, and Bells Falls, which have a fair amount of retail, fair, probably a good lot of minimum wage jobs or at least lower paid jobs, shall we say, versus um, Warrior Junction, Thetford, where there's, there's so few jobs anyway that almost all the employment is on the other side of the river. That's right. So we could do, you could do an analysis in, you know, in my, in my area and find, well, it ain't much change, pardon my colloquial, because mm -hmm. people are working in New Hampshire anyway where they pay whatever, versus mm -hmm. Bellows Falls, or Brattleboro in particular, where there's there's something to compare. So if you were asked to do a study, um, and, there, and there may be good examples in 
in um, Northeast Kingdom that would be worth comparing to. But anyway, just comment, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, it's really interesting, the, the variation that occurs all the way up and down yeah. the Connecticut River. And there's, and there's far more commercial interaction yeah. there than either the Massachusetts or the New York uh, border <coughs> and the New yeah. York border because there are fewer crossings and not the same population right. centers. Right. Um, but the flows come from New Hampshire to Vermont in the southern parts, around the Brattleboro yeah, yeah. area, and they go the other direction, right over area. Junction to yeah. to Lebanon, Hanover, and and they also go to New Hampshire in the Colebrook area farther north, yeah. even though they're small. Uh, so all these things matter, uh, and you know significantly, uh, you know you might get with in a, in a period of of uh, economic. Uh, high levels of economic activity, yeah. low unemployment rates, you might be better able to attract uh, New Hampshire workers. If we had something for them to do. If, well, Pardon my well there, there are jobs. I mean, look at the unemployment. Yes. So there are jobs that are yeah. there when you're getting these flows coming across. And if you're, it's probably having an upward impact on New Hampshire's uh, yeah. prevailing I, wage rate. Most but of those, I, I suspect, just to but one more nail on this is that the jobs that are available on the Vermont side of the river in, in my area pay considerably better than minimum wage anyway. Yeah, they have to, and that's the that's the point about the prevailing wage. So right. if you're raising it, like if you try to go out now and hire somebody who's really going to show up every day and you know be minimally productive, it's hard to find a person. You know, if you're for less than $10 now, yeah. like, and that's why I say the people that are still making below the minimum wage in New Hampshire are people who've been employed a long time and just haven't moved, you know, yeah. so they haven't raised the stink, they haven't tried to change jobs, they haven't, they're not sort of like aggressive in, 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 in doing that, uh, but if you're start, if you're hiring now at the yeah. margin, you've got to, you've got to pay considerably above yeah. that to really attract a quality worker. Yeah, thank you. So before I tried to hand you the scalpel, I meant to ask you one really quick question. <laughs> yeah, right. And <laughs> not being a surgeon, I gave it right back. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Point first. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is, is there any? You said that about seventy percent of the minimum wage workers in your cursory exam examination of uh, New Hampshire were women. Any reason to think Vermont is any different than that? Well, we have all the we data. data. The, okay. And, and, and what do you? Yeah. What is it in Vermont? Uh, it's. I don't. I can. I can look in that, but it is. Six fifty-six. I think it's fifty-six. I think it's. Yeah. I think Deb. Deb Brighton ran those, but in the um, at the end of the October study, there's a t there's a chart. I think that. But it also depends on if you're choosing if you're going by the current minimum wage or what what we minimum wage proposed. At yeah. Right. It right. Matters who's, uh, who's in that. <clears throat> age variance. Women were not highly educated. Education. Head of family. I think it was in the 50s, like mid 50s, okay. but I, I can okay. I can check it. But it's significantly lower. And then, uh, Cynthia, just one quick response. Um, when you wait till there's an emergency to operate, the outcomes are much worse. <laughs> I get that. Much worse. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's where your metaphor falls down. Yeah. We've just raised it three so times. I'm going to suggest that we're going to get a chance If it's a baby that's got to be delivered. To ask his question. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a baby that's got to be delivered, you got to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so a um, couple things. Yeah. You, the figure you mentioned about 3% possible job loss, then it's a different number that could be reduction in hours, right? Yeah, it, it could be the sort of an equivalent reduction in hours, and that's why it's important to measure hours worked as well as job counts. Right. Okay, and then isn't there another factor? Like, let's say um, somebody employs 20, uh, an owner employs 20 employees or whatever, and somebody has worked their way up from the minimum wage, whatever, you know, what it is now, 10 to 15 an hour, and making 13 to $14 an hour now. And as the minimum wage starts to increase, if this happened, they start to say, um, okay, I've got to save money somewhere else. So this employee who I was going to give a raise to now, I'm going to forego that raise. Does that type of stuff, can that happen? Yeah, that does happen. There, there are several things that happen. So there are people that are just above the minimum 
that when the minimum goes up, employers will want to keep some spread. You know, so people that are making 50 cents more than the minimum wage now, you know, you don't want to like all of a sudden put them at the same level. So there's, you know, there's that's called spillover effects. And, you know, it's we've used all the literature that's out there on this to try to estimate that. And it is a part of the overall uh, impact of it, but it does affect workers uh, mostly just above. Uh, the uh, the loss in hours or wages is it's not only minimum wage workers. I don't mean to imply that. It, it could be above, and it could also be if a company completely closes, it's the management and everybody, everybody. else. It's everybody. So those all are part of the count. It would just be if you concentrated all of those where most of the minimum wage where most of the job losses would occur or the hour losses occur would be most likely to occur uh, among minimum wage jobs because you'll either you know invest more in capital to automate so you can substitute capital for labor you'll do something or you'll try to get by with less labor uh, in different ways and there, there are ways that firms have done that very creatively um, but the, the the primary response is a price response. You know, people raise prices. If you can, try to come, if you can, yeah. And if you don't have, if all your competitors are faced with the same labor problem, then your competition is going to raise prices at the same time. It's not that that doesn't have any effect on demand. It still decreases demand a little bit, depending on the industry. Um, but it's that that's not huge compared to a competitive loss. If you raise a price and your competitor doesn't have to. It's really hard to stay in business when somebody can just choose a chance. Hey, so it would be true that some, I mean, many minimum wage workers are employed by small business, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know that we did a break on this. Uh, that is something we could do more stuff. You don't have it by size of, I think we got it in a prior study by size of establishment. Uh, we didn't run that this time, but Deb Brighton did some, some uh, with census data, uh, might have some information on that. But we didn't do it this time on by size of business. Did we take into account anything like if you have a small business that's close to the margin, like some business, small businesses are, and they maybe fold up their business because of, they can't just keep up with? Well, that's the sort of thing that, you know, that follow-up studies, both survey-based and just statistical would be useful to sort of have information on. Um, there are sectors where we know sort of averages across a sector that are low margin, you know, businesses. Uh, so you could calculate, and you also get a share of labor, but those vary by individual company too. So it's it's kind of hard to make a blanket statement. Sorry, one last real quick one. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, you said it would be really expensive to do the Cynthia study. Well, oh, uh, county level. County level yeah. study. Uh -huh. Call it the Cynthia study. Um, <laughs> when, when, when you're... I mean, when you go to do it at a town level, too, I mean, that would... When you say... Um, when we do Brownington. There you go. When you say really expensive, I mean, can you give me a ballpark? Are we talking hundreds of thousands of dollars? Or what are, I mean, I'm not asking for an exact number, obviously, but... It would be in six figures, but it wouldn't... I don't think it would be high six figures, but it would. It might be 150 to... $200,000 or something. If you have the software then and you have that, that could be used again. We'd have to collect, oh yeah, once yeah. we develop it. Be would, it have, would it have been less expensive had we done this as part of this current study? I mean, sure, to, just because we're into it and doing it all at the same time. And then you can design it differently so you know you're doing it at the county level. So everything you're doing is collecting and, and measuring stuff at that level. Um, yeah. Thanks. We've never in the past been asked to do that right. so, either, but it's a, a real, if, you know, it's a point of interest. If you had been asked to do that, would you be better able to answer George's question about whether this is the time to operate? <laughs> uh, we'd have more granularity about it, uh, and you and it might inform, if you were going to do something that had a differential wage thing, like some states have done, it would give you a, a, a better basis for doing that and choosing who's in and who's out and where you draw the lines about uh, a differential wage. Um, and it would just be more information about, you know, the whole patient. I don't think you should be telling us anyway what we should do. I know. But I'm not looking for that. Yeah. 
I, no, I, no, I, but I, yeah. but I meant it was actually a serious question, and I didn't mean it to sound flip. And I, I, you know, part of what I struggle with here is, and it's where you started. We have an awful lot of data, but we don't quantify the social benefit of raising the wage because we can't really. I and mean, that there's something, there, there is a, there is some, um, for some of us anyway, there's a benefit that can't be measured and can't be quantified, and so a lot more data, um, I'm trying to understand whether that helps us make that way those two things, um, and in, in what way, and you've an answered the yeah, question. Yeah, you have more granular. If we it's, wanted it's, to do a differential wage, it would give us some information yeah, on so how I, to do that. You guys are the surgeons, and I, yeah. I'm not I'm not taking the scalpel no matter what. Uh, but I can be one of those machines that's telling you whether the heart's beating or not and how fast and stuff like that. And if you say, if we had a better machine, could it tell you more about how it's beating in the leg and the arm and the whatever? You know, more information's, you know, always if we operate better, whether we might kill the patient. What's the marginal cost of all those practices? We're using all these. <laughs> all right, but I mean, just to, no, just, I, I, yeah, so it's just more information about what's happening in the process, and it's not like saying after the fact, oh, the heart rate went way down. Right. Uh, right. Too bad we didn't know that at too the time. Too bad we lost that county. Again. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Um, anyway. I have a question about um, federal tax changes and the, the um, amount of um, the, the lower taxes that Vermont individuals and Vermont businesses are going to be paying because of the federal tax changes. Okay, separate How did topic. those factor into your analysis? Of minimum wage? Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, that happened way after Should any they, of the minimum wage uh, would, analysis. Would your study look differently now that those changes have gone into effect? Um... Without, you know, there are a lot of corners to this, and there, <laughs> that's, I, I don't think I could say just off the top of my head uh, if, if you'd like me to think about that more thoroughly. Yeah. There's just a lot of levels of that, both on the corporate side, some right. of which are still being worked out, right. and the personal income side, and you'd have to tell me what the current law version is not well I'm talking about the federal changes because we I know but the federal state. changes that yeah. pass through no, the I'm state I'm talking about the federal changes that affect the the taxes that are the federal taxes that are paid by businesses in the month. Um, meaning it just yeah it, but so I mean when you said the federal changes yeah. there are things that flow to the state that right, you would also have to take yeah I'm not account. talking about not those just at the just the federal just changes the federal. at the federal level yeah so you're getting lower tax payments. That would be, uh, but it didn't really affect the low end so much. So does it affect the businesses in the state? Uh, yeah, you're going to have lower business taxes and corporate taxes. But then the shareholders, the benefit to shareholders in terms of minimum wage analysis, uh, it's not a class that's heavily affected. Does it give businesses more profit? Yeah, but it gives all of them more profit, so their competitors are in the same boat, so you still have a competitive variation. There are a lot of wrinkles to it. I, that's, that's, a, that's like a really quick answer, but it's a much more in-depth topic if you wanted me to think through all the possible areas and what things are significant and what not. Uh, it, would take, it would take longer than have something more thoughtful. Uh, I don't know where you have to be next, but I I'm not sure either, but it's, there's, there's, okay, appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank well, you. You're yeah. next on our list, but if you don't mind, we're going to take a five minutes. And we'll for some of your questions or chapter or what's this happening. Yeah. Something that he's doing will be back Yes. Good morning, Matthew Berwitz, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Thank you so much for having me this morning. And you're certainly all 
primed and ready to go on the topic of minimum wage. So I will certainly allow this conversation to go in whatever direction you think is appropriate. Um, you know, I've already heard more questions and you know, what I would consider to be important questions being asked than I have over the um, the jury, uh, over the uh, duration of this conversation, which started with the summer study committee, uh, the Vermont Department of Labor. I was assigned as the Vermont Department of Labor staff person for the summer study committee. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to uh, testify because they had a full schedule. But I was uh, an observer of that discussion and did see the work product that was created. Um, and one of the things that struck me the most about that conversation and the subsequent conversations and related to minimum wage in many conversations is the question that continues to be asked is what will happen? What will happen if we do this? And yet I've already heard in this room today more people ask the question, the question I wanted to ask, which is what has happened than has been asked previously. And this question of what has happened I think is as important because there is no disagreement. The one thing there is no disagreement on is that we are all looking for the best way to assist Vermonters. Um, whatever their income um, goals are, whatever their life circumstances are, is figuring out the best way to assist Vermonters to become self-sufficient. Um, but the conversation about what will happen and um, has not has been has dominated versus what has happened. And so, unfortunately, while I can provide the information that I have available to me and some of the things that I've been able to look at, um, I'm probably going to provide more questions than I have answers. So. Um, as it relates to traditional economic theory, one of the things that first out of the gate, anyone would say, you raise minimum wage, labor force participation rate will increase. That has not happened. Labor force participation rate, and uh, even holding consistent for age groups, has held flat at best and declined for many. So already, there's a question. And I think the way uh, Mr. Cavett um, characterized the Washington studies, you could almost characterize 100 years of minimum wage research. Many people start out with an objective, they research it, and it matches their objective. Other people look at a narrow swath, and they come with inconclusive results. That, you know, there is no bigger question in economics, yet there is no clear answer, which gives me another reason to draw pause other than the minimum wage. If you look at case studies across the country, which many people do, you see no correlation between the minimum wage and wage inequality. You see no correlation in wage, or the minimum wage and poverty. And in fact, our, re our record on poverty um, last year went up, even though the minimum wage went up. Income inequality, we're middle of the pack, even though we're in the upper tens um, for our minimum wage. You look at states across the nation, they're, they're, they run the gamut, similar to the GDP question. They run the gamut between high levels of poverty and low levels of poverty. High levels of wage inequality, low levels of wage inequality. So it goes back again to the question of what is the purpose of the minimum wage and what is the purpose that we're trying to, what, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, Art Wolf uh, uh, quotes a, a statistic that is a, a big part of this discussion when we're talking about people of limited economic means. 50% of people in poverty do not have wage income. So if you're looking at the population of people below the federal poverty line, minimum wage is only going to address half of them anyway. And so from the department's standpoint, where we have a charge to work with all employers, all Vermonters, and try and improve the outcome for all of them, there's a big part of the population that will not even be assisted with the increase in the minimum wage. So once we separate that out, then we can talk about of those that may be impacted, now we can get into the discussion of where uh, you had much of the discussion with Tom Cavett, and we can continue. Yeah, the, of the 50% without wage income, how do they survive? Um, what do you know about Great them? question. Um, much of it is uh, government payments. OK. So um, they're on some sort of assistance. Mm -hmm. Or they're barely surviving at all. Yep, or it could be uh, independent wealth, or it could be wealth that's generated outside of wage income. So if it's real estate or... It could be self-employed, yeah. right? Uh, so self-employed is still... Right, could be self-employed because it's the way it's filed, right? Yep. Okay. But it's not wage income. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so, um, and what I find also interesting is that they, it, this is a very top, uh, confusing and nuanced conversation. And so every time you hear the wage, the word wage, I always want to stop the question and say, wait, are you referring to hourly wage or annual wage? Because there's pretty much universal agreement. I don't think there's any disagreement that hourly wage will increase across the Vermont economy if you increase the minimum wage. What I don't hear a lot of discussion or clarification on is when people talk about rising wages, are we talking about annual wages? Um, so with the Vermont Department of Labor, we have access and information to a lot of data that gets collected. 
and it's always best if you can have multiple sources pointing in the same direction. And as it relates to hours worked, we have two data sources coming from two different uh, two different sources, two data sources coming from and pointing to the same conclusion, which is that hours have decreased in the, the Vermont economy. So, for example, if we ask Vermont employers in the private sector, how have hours changed? Hours worked changed in the private sector over the since 2008. They would report they have reported that they've gone down about three percent. So, if you take into factor hourly wage increases. The hourly increases have been actually eroded um, by decreases in wages or hours worked. And when we look at that data, unfortunately, we can't break it down into types of workers, but I think it's a reasonable assumption to assume that the people who are getting decreased wages are those at the lowest level of the skill level. Decreased. Decreased hours. hours. Excuse me. That Yes. So when we see a decline in hours, I think it's reasonable to assume it's not the people that are, um, you know, making an hourly rate but working full time as a professional. It is people more on the margins because there was a question regarding um, large versus small employers and there are large employers that are equipped to handle these type of things. Shifts in technology, how they target. So large stores now actually buy software to help them maximize um, when their labor is on shift. So maybe they right. used to have four hour shifts, now they have a program to say we only need you for two and a half hours. And even big box retails are even going to more of an on-call nature, which is, again, contracting the number of hours worked. And I apologize if I'm talking so fast. I've been sitting in the corner, and boy, my mind has been <laughs> reeling about like, <laughs> with thoughts cool. to say. So I can just, <laughs> so slow me down. We're slow me down. Fast. So I may have missed it, but the 2000, that statistic you got, 3% mm -hmm. decrease, 2008 until when? 2016. 2016, yeah. thank you. So a decline in, this is what employers are telling us. Employers are saying in the average hours, the average number of hours worked in a week has done, gone down in the state of Vermont over that period of time. Despite the economic recovery. Despite the economic recovery. And the reasons for